This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Do you want a new podcast to look forward to each week? One that's got it all, entertainment, information, and stuffed with actionable content? Yeah, you do. Because who wouldn't want to listen in as Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people from athletes, authors, and scientists to mobsters and spies? Each week, Jordan uses his interviewing talents to bring you never-before-heard stories and insights to make life more understandable. He has one of the most highly rated self-development shows out there. Listen in, learn, and look forward to each new episode, like I do. And I would like to recommend a few episodes myself. The first one is episode 650, Brian Kloss, The Corruptible Influence of Power. And the other one is episode 585 with Timothy Snyder, 20th Century Lessons on Tyranny. Check them both out. You can't go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II, Episode 56, Breaking Point. Last time, the Battle of Britain, the battle that would end the war in Europe, as far as most were concerned, spilled over into September. Kesselring had tried Goering's approach of smashing fighter command in a few massive blows, but Britain turned out not to be another Poland, or Norway, or Belgium, or France. Britain had a system in place that allowed them to defend themselves and then recover after being attacked. So, Kesselring, taking his own measure of the enemy to the north, figured out that if he could not bomb their capital until it submitted, then only persistence, dealt with a heavy hand, would defeat the RAF. But this process was slow, and he had Goering breathing down his neck, who had Hitler breathing down his neck. But the scale of the war and how it was being carried out was about to change. Hitler had had enough of Berlin being bombed, and so took off the restraints regarding the bombing of London. Kesselring, not relishing the coming civilian deaths, was still relieved. By bombing London, the end of the war was in sight. But first, he had to weaken fighter command to the point where his bombers could get through, without suffering unacceptable losses. So, the pressure was increased on fighter command, their pilots, and the entire defensive system, which was straining to keep the threatened Nazi invasion at bay. And if Kesselring could have looked his enemy in the eye, he would have seen that they were wearing down. It was common for British pilots to fall asleep, literally, just as their planes stopped rolling. Added to their exhaustion was a lack of a sense of victory or accomplishment. One simply failed to get killed that day. One day ran into the next, which ran into the next. The concept of a Tuesday soon meant nothing to these pilots who lived their lives on a cycle. You were either on call, on standby, or had the day off. Of course, the Germans were in the same position. German bomber pilots talked of their dread of going up, of ditching in the sewer, as they called the channel. But as many casualties as the bombers suffered, their fighter pilots started dying even more, because Kesselring was sending up more of them to protect the bombers. Still, as September opened, the fight in relation to casualties and lost aircraft started going the Luftwaffe's way. With more Messerschmitt fighters coming over with the bombers for protection, the fight was more and more between them and the British fighters, and the Germans were sending over their best. Also, the Rot, Group, Staffel, or whatever sized formation of fighters came over, generally had more experienced pilots as well, 
Whether they gained that experience in Spain or in Poland or in France, they were ready. And finally, the Luftwaffe's tactics had already been worked out by Mulders years ago. Touching on the experience of pilots, here again, the battle between Park of 11 Group and Lee Mallory of 12 Group showed itself. Park wrote in late August to Fighter Command Headquarters that the replacements from Lee Mallory were far more inexperienced than replacements from 13 Group further north, and that it only took one good bounce by a few ME 109s to damage a newly arrived squadron to the point where it had to be sent north again to recover and to be rebuilt. Of course, the only squadron recently activated not to suffer like the other newbies was the Polish 303 Squadron. They were not hindered by British tactics or formations or manuals. They flew as a unit with barely contained rage and by November of 1940 had 126 kills the most of any squadron in the battle. But the other newly trained British pilots were flying by the book and paying the price for it. These newbies needed to learn the ropes and fast, because Kesselring was determined to keep up the pressure and break fighter command before his own command crumbled around him. On Sunday, September 1st, Kesselring was pretty much done with a sleight-of-hand approach. He was coming after the southeast of Great Britain, through its airfields, planes, and pilots. But he did keep one very effective trick that gave his bombers the maximum element of surprise, while simultaneously reducing Fighter Command's reaction time. After weather and reconnaissance flights confirmed the weather was fine and no surprises laid in store for him, Kesselring sent over two large formations, straight up the Thames estuary. These two groups had emerged from an even larger swirling mass of German aircraft hovering over Calais. And as before, the two groups broke into four smaller formations and dashed for their targets. The formations were made up of Dorniers with their escorting ME-109s and 110s. One group went for East Church, just south of the Thames, Another for Detling, just south of Eastchurch. Another for the Tilbury docks in London. And the last group made for the long-suffering Biggin Hill, west of Detling. These raids were smaller than of the last two days, but it was the persistence that Castle Ring was counting on. Biggin Hill was cratered some more, but repair crews, by working through the night, would allow the airfield to accommodate one squadron, by morning. At Tilbury Docks in London's East End, the bombs did considerable damage there. The rail lines, railway station, gas, and water mains were destroyed. Also raised to the ground were dockside buildings and workshops, along with a few private homes. At East Church in Detling, the now normal routine played itself out, as craters were made and everyone on the ground ran for cover. But the airstrip was soon back to being operational. In the air, both sides drew blood that morning. By 1.30 that afternoon, the Germans were back. Again, the formations flew up the Thames, only to then split and go after their targets. This time, the airfields at Kenley, just south of London, and Biggin Hill. But just to be safe, a squadron from 12 Group covered North Weald just over the Thames. Again, during the attacks, both sides lost aircraft and pilots. Biggin Hill's operations room suffered a direct hit for the second time, so all but one of its squadrons were sent to Croydon. However, the repairmen there focused not on the operations room, but on its temporary replacement in the nearby village. The German bombers would have to be extremely lucky to hit Spice and Wallace, Quality Family Butchers of 11 Godstone Road, Carterham. The third and last major raid of the day came a few hours later, around 3.30, and lasted for over an hour. The airfields at Debden, Kenley, Hawkage, and Lim were either strafed or bombed. 
But with this third large raid, Kesselring got what he wanted. A crack at British fighters. 85 Squadron was stationed at Kenley. But because the raiders did not separate and make for the airfield until the last minute, 85 Squadron was not able to achieve the height they needed, and so were bounced by the 109s. Within minutes, four hurricanes were shot down. Two pilots died, and two were missing. One of the missing was Patrick Wood Scowen, the brother of Tony, the nearsighted pilot. Later, his plane was found half-buried in the Kenley Recreation Park, but Patrick himself was not. The hope was that he bailed out and would turn up later. Debden had been ignored for a while, but Fighter Command's ability to react there had not been slackened by the quiet. However, with only a few minutes' notice, it suffered, as had Hawkage and Lim, with strafing and off-the-mark bombing. London, for the most part, had been ignored, but only because Kesselring had his plans for the day, which required maintaining pressure on relatively few airfields. If fighter command could be forced to abandon them and move further north, that would go a long way to making sea line possible. Like the daytime attacks, the bombing that night was relatively lighter than the last two days, but still intense, and Sperla's men focused on the Midlands and South Wales. Liverpool was again attacked. The nighttime raids might have been fewer, but considerable damage was done. The city of Bradford suffered tremendously, as did the naval oil depot at Land Darcy, just above the Bristol Channel. There, the fire was so intense, repair crews had to wait until morning to even make an attempt to get things under control. But then it was decided to let the five tanks, each containing 10,000 tons of oil, burn themselves out. It would take a few days, but nothing could be done about it. By the time the sun came up on September 2nd, Gehring's plan of intimidation was well underway, as just over 100 civilians died, with another 585 injured. Losses for the day were 15 for the RAF and 14 for the Luftwaffe. Total reported losses to date were 444 and 756, respectfully. That day, the 1st of September, the battle on the seas continued as well, and every nation involved in the conflict suffered losses. Great Britain, Fascist Italy, Vichy France, and the Free French, as well as the Greeks, who were technically neutral, but leaning towards the Allies. One of the vessels damaged was the HMS Fiji, which was taking part in Operation Menace. Under the control of Charles de Gaulle, free French forces, along with 8,000 British troops under British command, had set sail the day before on their way to Dakar in French West Africa, or modern-day Senegal. The plan was to wrest control of the port from Vichy French forces. For de Gaulle, it was to be the beginning of reviving French honor. And for the British, they hoped to prevent German U-boats from using the base to harass trade routes. The question was, how would the Vichy forces there react to de Gaulle leading Free French and British forces? Monday, September 2nd, would have the normal weather for that time of year, with haze in the channel and being mostly clear everywhere else. But the haze did not factor into the Luftwaffe's attack plans anymore. Park had conceded the channel. Now the fight was over Great Britain, over their airfields and towns. Kessel Ring's word of the day was unchanged. Persistence. But there would be more than the normal attacking waves than usual. The pressure on fighter command was to be pushed upwards again. So the German formations crossed over Dover early, right before 8 a.m. They flew together a little further than normal, and then split for their respective targets. East Church, Rochford, North Weald, and Biggin Hill. Each target 
would be visited by a group of bombers of about 36, escorted by a Geschwalder of 109s, each of about 100. Each church found themselves with a few more craters and a few less structures after the bombers left. Rochford got lucky as the attackers missed with their bombs, instead hitting the edge of the Gravesend airfield. The North Weald Raid, which did not manage to penetrate the defending British fighters, suffered losses and had to settle for dropping their loads somewhere on their way back home. But the formation heading toward Biggin Hill did get through, though there wasn't much more to aim at. 603 Squadron responded to this attack, and at least two 109s were shot down. Around 12.30 that afternoon, another raid appeared over the channel, only to split while flying up the Thames. Again, airfields were hit as squadrons were scrambled at the last minute, only when the real targets finally became known. Park considered this and wanted the mass formations attacked before they could split. Not only would this hopefully interfere with the Luftwaffe's plans, but it would give the British fighters more targets to go after. Both sides lost planes and pilots on this latest raid. Just after four o'clock, the Germans were back, crossing over the channel. Horn Church and East Church were targeted, East Church for the second time that day. The German bombers did what damage they could at Horn Church but had more success at East Church as a bomb dump was hit, and the following explosion, massive. East Church was now on the point of being unusable. But the Germans' best score of this sortie was at Weybridge in Surrey, just southwest of London. There, two factories were flown over, both owned by Vickers. One made the Wellington bomber, the other made Hurricanes. The bomber plant was hit, but the damage was not extensive. The hurricane factory escaped unharmed. But it was assumed the Luftwaffe would return. During the raid on East Church, 43 Squadron helped to repel the raiders. Tony Wood Scotland was doing his best, despite the fatigue, fear over his brother's fate, and his worsening eyesight. That was probably due to the fatigue but there was nothing for it. Tony chased a 109, got off a short burst, and saw smoke. But wanting to make sure it was a kill, he followed the 109 as it went lower. However, in his zeal, he forgot the number one maxim in air combat, to keep an eye on your rear as much as you watch your front. Soon, Tony's plane was hit and damaged, but that was nothing new. He then found himself needing to bail out. That was nothing new. But what he didn't consider was that, in following the 109 down, he himself had lost altitude, and his parachute would not have the height it needed to fully deploy. His descent was witnessed by a parson, who ran over when Tony crashed down. He was dead from the impact. Hey everyone, Ray here. I've never told you this before, but I live in a cove. It's very nice. But everyone around me is retired, and they spend hours every day on their lawn, which always leaves my yard bringing up the rear. But now I have a ringer, that being Sunday Lawn Care. This year will be different. Yes, spring is here, and it's time to get the lawn ready and keep it looking great. Again, I'll be leaning on Sunday to help me, and if you should give them a try, like me, you'll not have to worry about chemicals. Your lawn will look great, and your family will be safe. Because Sunday can help you grow a beautiful lawn without the guesswork or the nasty chemicals. Here's how it works. When I signed up for Sunday, their lawn analysis tools created a personal nutrient plan delivered right to my door when I need it. They send the packages, I attach them to my garden hose, and spray. I'm done in less than 15 minutes. No more hard work. Instead, I'm working smarter. And you can too. And Sunday is offering our listeners 20% off. Full season plans start at just $129, and you get 20% off 
at checkout when you visit GetSunday.com slash World War II. That's 20% off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash World War II. Just as the German aircraft crossed back over the channel, returning home, the fourth attack set out. It turned out to be more exploratory than the other raids, just seeing how and if Fighter Command would respond. The Germans made for the Isle of Sheppey, just south of the Thames, and, as exhausted as the pilots were, Fighter Command did respond, and so the raiders only harassed the area and returned home. The fifth and final raid of the day turned out not to be a proper raid at all. Of course, Fighter Command could not know this, and so responded, as the 80-plus formation made for North Foreland. The Germans menaced the area and were soon heading home. But again, this caused Fighter Command to use up their fuel, aircraft, and their most precious resource, their pilots. Losses on this bloody day were 31 for the RAF and 35 for the Luftwaffe. Total reported losses to date were 475 and 791, respectfully. That night, the bombing was moderate, but targets were varied and scattered throughout the Midlands and southern Britain. Many bombers flew over central London, but the main targets seemed to be Liverpool, the Midlands, and South Wales. However, most of the bombing was done by 1.30 a.m. Sperla's men were tiring, just like everyone else. By morning, some 50 civilians were found dead, with another 247 more injured. On the seas, at least four Allied vessels were sunk, along with one German transport ship, which was heading for Norway. All hands, including just over 800 German infantry troops, were lost. Although both sides could not know it, Tuesday, September 3rd, would end in a draw. Biggin Hill would be hit twice that day, and Dr. McIndoe's East Grinstead Guineas Pig Club would have another member. Losses of pilots were to be expected, so the real question, as to maintaining the high quality of attack or defense, was the success of each side's replacement program, and fighter commands was starting to show its cracks. There were already too many deaths or injuries, and some of those men lost had the experience and leadership doubting needed. The Germans were suffering from the same losses, so started rotating their men from other parts of the Nazi Empire. But most German pilots were already in France, and so there was very little relief for those men who were expected to go up each time the word went out. The question was coming down to whose overall system would unravel first. And RAF intelligence determined that the Luftwaffe could hold out for another three weeks or so at this stepped-up pace and intensity. So, could Fighter Command hang in there for that same amount of time? Or would their stockpile of fighters go unused? Considering the state of the airfields and their pilots, no one in Downing's inner circle, except himself, even wanted to think about fighting that far into the future. After all the dismal weather the Luftwaffe had to put up with for the last month, frustrating Gehring's original timetable, Kesselring could only thank the deity of his choice for another day of fine weather. He would continue driving fighter command away from the southern coast while he had their aircraft shot out of the sky. After the routine reconnaissance flights, around 8.30 that morning, and making sure that there were no more tempting targets, he launched his attack upon the southeast. A little after 9 a.m., a large formation crossed over the channel, but changed things up by splitting before reaching the Thames estuary. One formation of just over 20 aircraft headed for Deal, but was turned back by a single squadron. Another formation, flying about 5,000 feet higher of about 80 bombers and fighters, crossed north of the estuary and hoped to lure up a British response and then bomb any target 
that became open. They would eventually do damage at Hornchurch and Debden before returning home. A third formation of about 30 Dornier bombers, escorted by 50 ME-110s, made for North Weald. This attack would be the largest of the day, and at North Weald, a squadron had just landed and was refueling as the Germans came over. This combination had the makings of a massacre on the ground. But squadrons from 12 groups Duxford Station were coming in fast from the north. The aircraft met over the airstrip, but the Dornier still managed to destroy two hangars, two parked hurricanes, and damage some of the living quarters as well as the main stores and add craters to the field. Also, the airstrip to the south and southwest could now not be used due to the unexploded bombs lying about. The old operations room was hit, as was the new one, but there was no damage there. But here again, the Germans were having success, but paying heavily for it. 310 Squadron managed to take out five ME-110s and a bomber, in exchange for losing one hurricane. 19 Squadron from Duxford was also there to help, but again, the cannons jammed on their Spitfires. When they got home, they clamored again for traditional Spitfires, and were soon told that eight were on their way. They were older and battered, but their machine guns would not let them down. Biggin Hill also received some attention that morning, and the usual pattern played out. The airfield was cratered, but was still operational. That was the advantage of having a relatively large flat area as a runway. But the Germans would be back later that morning. The Luftwaffe returned around 11.15 a.m., just as the first wave was returning home. It was hoped that the British fighters, now low on fuel and ammunition, could be caught by the second wave's fighters. A formation of 30-plus aircraft crossed over near Deal, but were soon forced off course. Their bombers managed to hit Manston on their way home. After the usual break in the action, two formations of at least 12 each crossed over near Fornes, but were driven off. An hour later, six small formations then came over. It seemed that most of these were a decoy, or a distraction, because only one of them made directly for a target, that being Biggin Hill. Kesselring was determined that this fighter command post would be made useless, but four squadrons rose to challenge, and one of them was 603 Squadron. Richard Hillary of 603 managed to get behind a 109 and fire off a short burst. He could see the damage was done, but the aircraft did not start into the telltale dive, signifying its end. So Hillary kept following the Messerschmitt and then gave another short burst. But as had happened so many times before, and would happen to many others, Hillary forgot to check his six. Just as he finished his second burst, he heard a loud bang and the controls were suddenly out of his hand and his plane was on fire. The situation was beyond his control and he knew it. But as he tried to slide the hood back to make his escape, it resisted. It was then that he remembered that it was a new hood and not worn in. He finally managed to open it and jump out, but by then he was badly burned. He came down on the North Sea, near Margate, and the pain was immediate as his burned body made contact with the water. Unbearable, the pain seared through him, so he decided to quicken his death by drinking seawater. But then he remembered a quote from Goethe, which never failed to move him, and he decided to stick it out. He ended up sticking it out for another three hours, before being hauled aboard a lifeboat. He was soon the latest member of McIndoe's Guinea Pigs Club. Losses for the day were 16 for each side. Total reported losses to date were 491 and 807, respectively. The intensity of the bombing that night was about the same as the previous one, the main targets being Liverpool, South Wales, and this time the Kent area. Most of the bombing was done by 1 a.m., except for the unfortunate Liverpool, 
which went on for another hour and a half. By morning, there were at least 37 civilian casualties, with another 100-plus injured. Mine lane by the Germans picked up along the coasts from Aberdeen in the north to the Thames, and along the south coast from Dover to Poole. For itself, Britain decided that any mines laid near the Belgium coast to impede the invasion would be done by RAF aircraft. This was decided after several mine lane ships ran into German mines, and they were all lost in a single night. On the seas, at least nine people died, with another 36 injured, as the Germans exchanged one U-boat for three British vessels on September 3rd. But the vessels of Operation Menace were still en route for Dakar. The next day, September 4th, the weather was again what Kesselring needed it to be, and he would continue with his attacks on airfields, surprise attacks, and going after whatever fighters the British put into the air. He had come to respect Fighter Command's defense system and abilities, and therefore knew that only constant pressure, as he was applying it, would win the day. It was bloody for both sides, but it was the only way to get at the British fighters. But now he had to incorporate Goering's plan of a few days ago to destroy British aircraft production. And now he knew where some of their facilities were, at Brooklands and Surrey. The reconnaissance flights were to be more numerous that day. The far north, in fact, saw them all day long and tried to intercept But by the time the fighters were launched, the German planes were gone. The same thing played out in the east and the west. To hopefully confuse fighter command for today's attacks, the first group of plotted aircraft were detected heading toward the Isle of Wight and Portland a little after 7 a.m. They were chased away easily enough, but it was hoped that the British would be looking that way more than usual. But just over an hour later, the Germans were back to their routine. A group of 150 or so bombers and fighters flew up the Thames estuary before separating. After splitting roughly in half, the larger group split again and went after four fighter command airfields, two above the Thames and two below. 66 Squadron, which had just arrived at Kenley, just south of London, was in on the chase. However, they were new and were soon bounced by the few 109s sent over that day. Three Spitfires were lost, with another three damaged, and five of their pilots were wounded. The other formation split, and then attacked Lim in the southeast corner near the coast, as well as Biggin Hill, located in the southeast corner of the greater London area. However, damage was not extensive, and operations there continued. Before the day was out, Group Captain Grice of Biggin Hill decided to go up in the air and try to ascertain what kept the Germans coming back to his airfield. It was a good question. There was only one structure left, an unused hangar, and some chairs the pilots used while waiting to be called on. Around these, the airfield was littered with freshly filled in holes from bombing. The staff was by now scattered to nearby homes when off duty. Flying over, Grice determined it must have been that one hangar, spotted every day by German reconnaissance flights, that kept his station on the Luftwaffe's mine. So, that evening, around 6 p.m., he ordered it destroyed. However, being RAF property, he was censured in a court of inquiry, but in the end was left alone. Noon had been selected as the time for the main attack that day, Gehring's latest idea, to destroy British aircraft production and thereby win the air battle, was to commence. So around 12.30, 70 plus HE-111s and Dornier 17s crossed the coast at 20,000 feet, and they were escorted by 200 ME-109s. They all soon split into five raiding formations and went after numerous airfields in Kent and Sussex. Nine RAF squadrons rose to chase them, and confusion ensued. And that was exactly what Kesselring wanted. After the formation split and scattered, a group of ME-110 fighter bombers snuck over during the chaos 
and made for Brooklands in Surrey. Although flying in low, they were spotted and 253 Squadron was sent after them. The ME-110s were mauled, but still made their target, the real target of the day, the production factories at Brooklands. The surviving ME-110s dropped their loads, but as before, hit the Wellington factory and left the Hurricane factory alone. Damage to the Wellington factory was serious. Production was halted for the immediate future, and casualties were left behind. The bombs dropped, and at least five of them found their mark, hit before the red light warning could be given. Casualties included at least 55 dead, with another 250 injured. These numbers could have been much higher had it not been lunchtime, which meant the workers were scattered about. The rest of the day was spent by the adversaries playing cat and mouse across the channel, but neither one committed to anything serious. Losses for the day were 15 for the RAF and 20 for the Luftwaffe. Total reported losses to date were 506 and 827, respectively. That night, the bombing started a bit earlier, around 10 p.m., and close to 100 bombers concentrated on South Wales, the Midlands, and, of course, Liverpool. Another 100 bombers or so focused on the southeast of Britain, with Mine Lane and some attention to London. By morning, there were at least 67 casualties, with another 330 more injured. On the sea, at least six non-Axis ships were sunk by German U-boats. One of the victims belonged to neutral Ireland. At 8 p.m. that night, U-boat 46 sank the Irish vessel Liam Nietzsche, which was carrying just over 1,200 tons of pyrites from Spain. Three crew members were taken prisoners, but were released two days later in France. Irish neutrality remained. Meanwhile, on the continent, the showdown between the two remaining military giants was taking shape. Romania had by now lost territory to both the USSR and Nazi Germany. With all that had taken place before and during the war, it only stood to reason that the rest of Romania would fall into one or the other's hands, eventually. So, being proactive and hoping for some kind of self-determination, King Carol II of Romania gave the remainder of his country to the pro-German general Ion Antonescu. Antonescu would waste no time in becoming prime minister and partnering with the fascist Iron Guard within the country. But all the actors on the Romanian stage were holding on to a false hope. Freedom was not their fate. In political terms, the war was about to change. Hitler, with Admiral Rader's words ringing in his ears, never fully believed in sea line. But if others thought it was possible, and Germany had to take some direction after the fall of France, why not let it be tried? But by now, it was clear to Hitler that fighter command was still in the air, and that every Luftwaffe aircraft or personnel lost would be one less for his next move against Stalin and the USSR. Since July, as the war raged over southern Britain, debates and discussions were held within German circles, some within Hitler's earshot and some not, about the proper way to bring Great Britain round. The Nazi leader held back the bombing of London, assuming that the British were looking at the same revised map of Europe he was, and would come to the same reasonable conclusion. But time went on. The British kept fighting back. Churchill made his maddening speeches. And Nazi Germany was losing valuable equipment and even more valuable men. Hey everyone, Ray here. So I'm sure you've seen the headlines. Inflation is up, everything is more expensive, and it's probably not going to get any better anytime soon. Which tells us all it's time to get our financial house in order. And that's where Upstart comes in. Upstart-powered personal loans can help you pay down high-interest debt, all online, with simple and easy-to-understand payment terms. So, whether it's paying off credit cards or consolidating high-interest debt, Upstart 
can help you get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. And this isn't your grandfather's loan process. Upstart considers more than just your credit score. You are more than that, and Upstart knows this. There's your employment history and income. All that is considered, too. And you can check your rate in minutes for loans between $1,000 and $50,000 without impacting your credit score. You can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Don't wait and check your rate today at upstart.com slash World War II. That's upstart.com slash World War II to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit, income, and certain other information provided in your loan application. Go to upstart.com slash World War II. By early September, the bombing of London seemed to be a necessary part of the only true way to end British resistance. After all, when was the last time Britain was successfully invaded? No, bombing London would inspire the needed terror and hopelessness, and was besides an economic weapon to boot. A ravaged capital with a submarine stranglehold would go a long way to helping Parliament see the light. Then, if need be, the empire, barely holding on at home, could be peeled like a piece of fruit. Gibraltar could be taken over by a joint venture between Germany, Italy, and Spain, or a combination of any two. Egypt could then be stripped away and the Suez Canal seized. And if Japan could be encouraged to move against British possessions in Asia, that was how you beat a fortress island nation. Literally, make the war too expensive to wage. On August 30th, Hitler directly told Goering, the man who had been with him from the beginning, his most loyal of followers, that the British still controlled their own skies. This fact, combined with the bombing of Berlin, pushed Hitler to cross a line he never thought he'd have to face. Not for humanitarian reasons, but because it seemed to Hitler that he had won. Britain could not amass the men and material needed to launch an invasion of Europe, at least for a few years, if ever. And by then, Germany would have humbled the Soviet Union and would by then truly own Europe. The U.S. showed no inclination of intervention. And besides, Hitler weighed their military prowess lightly. So why was England, as Hitler thought of it, holding out? Why go on? Why stay in a fight you can't possibly win? Hitler respected slash hated the British, and these feelings never allowed him to understand the island nation. But the leader of the Third Reich was a politician, as well as a leader of the German military, and he had learned a long time ago to give himself room to maneuver to deal with the unexpected. So, on September 3rd, he announced that S-Day, the earliest possible date Operation Sea Line could be launched, was being moved from September 15th to the 21st. Furthermore, its exact date would be decided three days in advance of its launch. He then mentioned something about transport barges being behind schedule, but Garing recognized it as the face-saving gesture for him, that it was. Meanwhile, Kesselring and Sperla continued their own argument about the war. Kesselring was of the opinion, based on the lost reports about British fighters, that fighter command was on its last leg, and hitting London would end the conflict. Sperla didn't believe that, nor the British losses claimed by the Luftwaffe fighters. He had seen the same thing in Spain and had learned to cut the numbers claimed in half, at least. But this argument was not one of equals. Not anymore. Hitler was now coming round to Kesselring's point of view, if for different reasons. Kesselring's fear was that his pilots were doing too good of a job. If fighter command gave up their southernmost airfields and battled on, the combat zone would have been limited to London and further north, 
clearly out of range of his vaunted 109s. But Kesselring's cool, logical mind determined that the airfields might be abandoned, but London could not be. That was his main argument for bombing the capital, and it was unassailable. The attacks on Berlin had been just as politically motivated as they were militarily, if not more so. This required a political reaction, and Hitler had finally decided on one. He chose the opening of the September 4th Winter Relief Campaign at the Sports Palast in Berlin for his speech. With the men away, the audience was made up of mostly women, those who would be directly affected by a threatened Berlin. The Nazi warlord started the speech with a joke. He said, the English were always curious about things, like, when is he coming, when is he coming? His answer to that was, don't worry, he's coming, he's coming. The audience thought that was very funny. He then got serious and said that, obviously, his peace offer of July 19th was taken as weakness. But he was here today to let everyone know that this perceived weakness was a mistake, and obviously so was his offer of peace. He ended with saying, the time will come when one of us will break, and it will not be National Socialist Germany, unquote. The crowds, thoroughly worked up, shouted, never, never, in response. Before one side broke, or rather, was broken, there would be over 60,000 British civilian deaths and over 600,000 German ones. The two great capitals would be ruined. But after Hitler's speech went out to the world, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill must have, in the deepest part of himself, grunted satisfactorily. If Hitler kept his word, there would soon be leveled cities and massive civilian deaths. But then, British airfields and Allied pilots could begin to ease away from the breaking point. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. I just wanted to thank everybody for their patience. We had that storm that changed everybody's lives, at least for a couple days, but um, we're mostly back to normal here. And I just wanted to ask everyone if you know of a good book, uh, either on Bomber Command or Mac and Doe's Guinea Pigs Club, just send me an email, let me know. I'd really like to, uh, to do an episode on those and cover that in, in greater detail. And for those of you who have donated recently, um, I will um, thank you next time. Um, the Internet situation is not back to normal because of all the power outages and all that kind of stuff. So I'll be thanking everybody next time. But again, uh, it really does make a difference here. And lastly, um, about the tour for any latecomers, if you're interested in going on uh, my World War II tour, you can check out historyworldtravel.com. It's got all the information there, the dates, uh, where we're going. It's going to be really amazing. To be honest, um, it's struggling a little bit, but I figure the economies in the U.S. and Europe probably have a lot to do with that. Um, But again, let me know if you have any questions. I'll be happy to uh, help you out. Uh, and the reason I'm really trying to push this one um, is because if we can get if we can get this one done, there'll be more in the future. But if this one kind of falls through, then uh, I'm not sure if I'll get another chance. So if um, if you have the time and the money, um, please consider it. It's going to be amazing. We're going to go all over Western Europe, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun. And again, I would like to see as many of you as I possibly can. And finally, uh, thank you to those who follow me on Twitter or Facebook or or who have written me. I really do appreciate it. The the emails inspire me and and keep me going. And for those of you who have recommended things or pointed out things, I really do appreciate it. So I will see you soon with Episode 57. Take care, everyone.